Welcome to the Logan Symposium. Yay! We're underway. <laughs> My name is Richard Logan. I'm the president of the Reva and David Logan Foundation. We're the main sponsors here. And we welcome you uh, to a couple of days of real excitement, I hope. So, uh, I'm going to read this because my memory isn't what it used to be. Uh, it's of great significance that we hold this semi-annual event in Europe. Uh, Europe which is both the crossroads of countless cultures, but also again uh, a burning cauldron of national interests and discontent. I hope you recognize that picture. We are exceptionally pleased to be here in Germany, a bastion of freedom and democracy, hard won from the tragedy and privation and blood of the 20th century. In fact, now the in the 21st century, Germany is among the leaders uh, with the most robust protections for individuals and human rights enshrined in their law. To be here in Berlin to freely and safely exchange ideas and challenge power is nothing less than a marvel and an excellent exemplar of what can be accomplished. We are all indeed lucky to be here, here in relative safety, surrounded by the champions and activists in the fight against unwarranted secrecy, illegal surveillance, and stifling censorship. But I must remind you, as I often remind myself, that the people who are most in jeopardy are not here today and those who will suffer the greatest consequences. They are journalists and members of isolated communities, minorities in lands with no legal or moral protections. They are the refugees and the immigrants and the dispossessed lost between endpoints. We must remember that we, all of us in other generations, uh, have suffered as well and that our commitment must always be to those who are least, least able to protect themselves. That's the deep stuff. At any rate, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce the executive director of the Center of Investigative Journalism, who last year uh, I introduced with a great long description and mellifluous tones, and this year, uh, <laughs> due to severe censorship, I will just say the ever youthful and indomitable Gavin McFadgen. <laughs> well. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's very kind of you. I, if you could repeat that, I'd be very grateful. <laughs> but let, let me say uh, a few words. In fact, I wasn't going to speak. We were going to have our colleague from Der Spiegel. In fact, we could actually, you could actually start if you like. Do you want to do it? Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, dear journalists, dear activists, dear artists, dear friends. Uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the news magazine Der Spiegel, uh, which happens to be the media partner of the CIJ Logan uh, Symposium in Berlin. Uh, I, I myself uh, uh, am writing and doing research for Der Spiegel since more than 20 years. And so I can reassure you, it is not by chance that Der Spiegel is supporting the Logan Symposium as its media partner. Uh, I can remember a cold winter day, not only like, like today, in early 2009, when an old friend of mine, uh, an activist with the Cars Computer Club, brought me together with a guy who told he was with an organization called WikiLeaks. Uh, Back then, hardly anybody had ever heard about WikiLeaks. I, I hadn't heard about WikiLeaks. Uh, but shortly after that first meeting, uh, I got the Spiegel editor um, and, and chief and two colleagues to meet that WikiLeaks guy. We had lunch together just a, a kilometer from here in an uh, Asian restaurant. And um, 
yeah, and that's where a cooperation started between Der Spiegel and WikiLeaks, which is going on till today. Der Spiegel, together with The Guardian and The New York Times, published the so-called collateral murder video exposing US war crimes in Baghdad. Uh, other WikiLeaks revelations uh, uh, did follow soon, like the uh, Afghan war diary, the Iraq war log, and the US State Department diplomatic cables. Uh, Der Spiegel, uh, who has been founded in 1946 by a quite remarkable journalist called Rudolf Augstein, has a great tradition in investigative uh, reporting. For instance, in 1962, uh, publisher Rudolf Augstein and several of his editors were imprisoned for publishing leaked uh, documents and materials from the West German Army, uh, the Bundeswehr. Augstein was behind bars for 103 days. There were big demonstrations against uh, this crude violation of the freedom of press. In the end, all the journalists were acquitted and Der Spiegel succeeded against the conservative government. Uh, and so it's also not by chance that the Rudolf Augstein Foundation is supporting the uh, uh, CIJ Logan Symposium. We, uh, the journalists that, uh, who work for Der Spiegel, continue believe, uh, to believe that investigative journalism is an ind is indispensable tool to control governments and big corporations to control powers of all sorts. Critical journalism and counter-narratives based on proper investigations are absolutely essential for a lively democracy. And as the technical possibilities for surveillance have been growing enormously, we as journalists have to develop tools to protect, protect our work and to protect our sources. Uh, not so much in Germany, but in many uh, other countries all over the world, the freedom of press is severely threatened. Just three days ago, a, a Turkish colleague, which I met a few times, the former editor with the Daily Birgün in Istanbul, has been sentenced for to 21 uh, months in prison. His crime that was that his paper wrote about corrupt practices of the family of President Erdogan. Uh, so, the subtitle of this symposium, Building Alliances Against Secrecy, Surveillance and Censorship, this subtitle is very up to date. So, welcome again uh, here in this lovely building, one of the few jewels of socialistic modern architecture we have in East Berlin. Uh, I wish, you, uh, I wish us, us all fruitful discussions, fresh insights and new ideas. Uh, you certainly will meet interesting people. Hopefully you will make new friends. All right, now you heard enough welcome words, uh, let's get started. Thanks. <laughs> ah. Thanks, Maya, that's great. <laughs> A quick question. Uh, we have 15 now, don't we? Direct, okay. Um, we're also... Uh, uh, about to uh, give a, a, a slightly different sort of generalized introduction to what we're going to be doing in the next two days. Because all of you know all the basics that, that, uh, uh, of what actually has transpired, what's unique about the political, economic, and journalistic climate that we have to work in. Uh, the primary uh, uh, change, all of you know, which is why you, uh, many of you are here, which is that the conventional ma a mainstream press in the world has proven to be inadequate in many ways to uh, actually publicize the very disclosures that have brought us all here today. Uh, they simply don't do it. I mean, the Spiegel is a, is a major exception to that. And uh, there are a few others in the world, but not very many. All the major papers uh, in the United States and in Britain publish almost nothing. If you think of the thousands and thousands of documents that WikiLeaks and Snowden have put out, how, what do they publish? Uh, the New York Times 6, The Guardian 15. And this is heralded as a huge victory for free speech. But in point of fact, it's the omission that's the critical factor. It's what they don't publish that is the most astonishing feature of all. And yet the huge machine which these documents expose marches on. 
And there's very little that seems to be breaking that event. Obama uh, made speeches and then made it even worse for everybody else. We now have the possibility of a Trump figure lurking somewhere in the darkness of America. And uh, that's a very scary prospect. Uh, if we thought it was bad already, um, it's, there's a lot more coming. I, w I hope not. Um, but curiously, there's the, the contradictions in the information business have, have begun to start in a curious way. And we can find cynical reasons for many of them. But the Apple FBI fight, for example, is part of that, where they find that their marketing propositions are very different now. Uh, that uh, they realize that there's a considerable body of opinion which opposes and, and uh, is violently opposed, in fact, to the kind of surveillance that they themselves are, continue to be party to where their entire backbone is now accessed by uh, the NSA and by the GCHQ in Britain. Uh, so very little, sadly, has changed. Uh, the, the courageous hackers who actually brought this information out, as you all know, are living in exile or occasionally in prison. Some uh, have been driven to suicide. There have been terrible consequences for those who had the courage to say enough is enough. Other people have lost their jobs, and we've, we have a number of people here who've done extraordinary revelations and paid a huge personal price for it. And we, we come, of course, to celebrate them and to hear what it is that they've done. Because amongst the most vulnerable um, are those dealing in information about people and companies, national security issues. Uh, many of us here and many of you out there, uh, two years ago, many of us realized that that there was an odd community between journalists and hackers, between journalists and technologists. And it's precisely because of the unity of purpose that that affords us that this meeting takes place. It's so that there can be a point of confluence between uh, hacktivists, uh, those who have a serious knowledge of how the computer world works and what it means, and the journalists whose job it is to expose these crimes and expose the abuses and human rights tragedies that become such an integral part of the system we live in. Uh, w without these tools that hackers, in fact, in large measure pr pr uh, provide us, we would all uh, be in great difficulty but be able to publish, as you know, very little or, or worse. Our sources, the key, re the reason why we can do what we do would be arrested. As it is now, not a single lawyer in any metropolitan country can speak without fear that they are being recorded. There's no confidentiality whatsoever for lawyers, for accountants, let alone for journalists and their sources, let alone for anybody in the government who might take a different view about what the moral purpose of their, of their employment is. So outside of this hall, by the way, the human price paid for so many of these people is being broadcast on the walls with an extraordinary thing. And there were hundreds of people. We began researching how many people are involved in and have been arrested and jailed and tortured and killed in this way. And it's an endless list. We, there was a huge issue about how we could contract that list because there were just too many people. Hundreds are now being killed and detained around the world. The uh, various campaigns on behalf of journalists only get a, a fraction of them. You have to put it together from a lot of sources, but it's pretty, pretty grim, actually. Uh, but the, the outside demonstration on the walls uh, and by projector is, is really impressive, and I I'd, uh, suggest you have a look at it if you've got a minute. So these two days are entirely devoted to information about surveillance, uh, about powerful new tools of investigative research, uh, of surprising new platforms uh, about whistleblowers, including Thomas Drake, Jesslyn Roddick, uh, and others, uh, and how they, they, the State Department has dealt with them and how they've, in fact, dealt with uh, the situation they find themselves in is an extraordinary story. Some of you have heard some of it. I suspect you'll hear a lot more that you don't know uh, later today. We also have an extraordinary uh, figure who helped to bring down the apartheid government in South Africa by extraordinary uh, scientific means and uh, handheld in a little place in, in London. Uh, he was able to construct a communication system called the Vula Network, which helped to bring down uh, that government. And uh, the man who designed it is with us uh, here. Uh, one of the reasons for the symposium is also as obvious. It's we are very conscious that the operating systems we use on computers are both a, a, some, a, obviously enormous tool for us, but also our greatest vulnerability. And as a result of, that, of the full consciousness that our vulnerability 
to these operating systems, which have back doors and which have, as you all know, many ways to compromise your own personal organizational journalistic security. Uh, there's been a desire to construct new, safer systems. And towards that end, we have a debate coming up of three contending systems, one of which it was, is used by Snowden and others called TAILS, and there's two remarkably similar but also wonderful systems which promise uh, an even greater degree of usability and friendliness and, uh, and, and serious security. One uh, called Subgraph, the other called Cubes, and we hope to hear them discussing what they do in a way that's particularly relevant to us as journalists. So one of the reasons um, uh, for what we, what we do is to provide that security for everybody else. Because unless we have that security of being able to publish, unless we have the security of knowing that somebody can talk to us freely, there is no freedom. There is no freedom of speech if people are terrified to speak to us because they know they're going to be arrested. Like 1,200 people were arrested in Libya and Tunisia as a result of French systems which were spying on their emails and all the rest which gave to the secret police precisely the tools that we're frightened that our government now has here and which we can be used against all of us if we dare to say anything they don't like. Um, so when, I think we have a timing issue here and I would like to ask how much more time, there's a clock down here that doesn't tell me very much. <laughs> Okay, so I, I was going to say that, uh, in fact, we can, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, and uh, a man who comes really from, from India and is very widely known. He's probably the most widely known journalist in Asia, uh, and not so well known ridiculously here. He wrote an extraordinary book called Everyone Loves a Good Drought, uh, and, but he's made uh, an extraordinary reputation for himself in India. Uh, much admired because he was the man who discovered what actually happened to 300,000 farmers who committed mass suicide and have done for the last years, which is the largest recorded suicide in human history. And that's going on a short distance from what uh, the newspapers print, which is bling, weddings, celebrity stuff all across India, but nobody was covering the deaths of all these people. And uh, to, with that end, I'd like to introduce P. Sinet, who could come up and, and, and talk to us. Uh, I would just, <laughs> I think over here. We may, we may have, if, if uh, we're lucky, another speaker from, coming to follow P. Sinet. But at the moment, P. Sinet, here you go. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Gavin. Good morning, all. Um, I'm not wired up, I'm going to speak from the lectern. But 40 years ago, the, the leading orator in my hometown gave me this advice. He still is around and a leading politician. He said, given a choice between speaking from the table and the lectern, always choose the lectern. That way you get to duck better when they throw stuff. <laughs> um, I have been a journalist 35 years as of September last year 23 of those full time a rural reporter I roam around the countryside and it's interesting to me that the most important developments in and impacting on journalism in the last decade or so have all come from outside the so called mainstream media they may have played, the stories may have run in the mainstream media or more accurately, the corporate media, but they've not come from there. Whether it was WikiLeaks and Julian Assange, whether it is Edward Snowden, whether it is uh, an Aaron Schwartz in the issues of the internet, whether it was uh, Chelsea Manning. It's astonishing actually how little of real significance. Of course there are exceptions. There are exceptions in anything. You know, you get honest people in lousy governments. So it's a different matter. But the fact is, we need to really ask ourselves, why are these gigantic media structures unable to put out anything but so much twaddle? Yeah? And very few 
really speaking, very few great impactful stories. That capacity has been diminishing very rapidly in the last 10, 15 years with the corporatization of the media. We need, I think, to break the corporate definition of what a professional journalist is. We can do that in the discussion. Uh, in India, in the last four or five weeks, something tragic and interesting, heartening and disheartening is going on. There have been major attacks on the campuses, on freedom of speech in the Indian campuses by, the, uh, by what is surely the nastiest government ever, ever to have ruled Delhi since independence. And the media's role in that has been quite alarming. Two major, two of the country's most important television networks doctored videos, ran doctored videos. I don't say they're doctored. The forensics laboratory, the Delhi government submitted them to say they're doctored. Imposing slogans in the mouth of students which they never uttered. And a, a government is at war with a bunch of college kids in the name of anti-national slogans. You know? And I mean, it's, it's really bad and it really makes you ask, what are we about in journalism today? I mean, this is apart from my off-stated position that there are essentially two kinds of journalism. There's journalism and there's stenography. Largely corporate stenography, which is what the media are largely about. <laughs> but um, there's always been a strong case for investigative journalism. In fact, I don't know why there should be any other kind, but but I think there is now an equally compelling case, not just for investigative journalism, but for investigating journalism. We really need to look, who are we? What are we doing here? What are the things that are happening? Journalism also unfolds in a particular context. I'm going to talk to you as uh, Gavin asked me to about the story that led to the exposure of the farm suicides, which by the way, government data, National Crime Records Bureau, Suicides data in India are compiled by the National Crime Records Bureau because suicide's a crime. You commit it, we'll teach you never to do it again. <laughs> and uh, the number of farm suicides, suicides by farmers, which is a high, terrible underestimate because they exclude very large groups. They almost totally exclude women farmers, for instance, because there is no land in their names. They don't have a, a title deed. Despite many major exclusions of many major groups, the government figures show us that over 300,000 farmers have committed suicide in the last 20 years, between 1995 and 2014. Yeah, that's 300,000. Excuse me. The, and that, those suicides have gone on since 95. In the year, in the decade 2001 to 2011, they occurred at the rate of one every half hour. One every half an hour, okay? We're talking about 300,000 human beings in the same occupation, taking their lives. The ratio of the suicides is in fact growing because even if the absolute numbers fall, since the base, population base of farmers is shrinking. But Again, I think that journalists, hacktivists, everyone have to be aware of a larger context in which this is happening. Otherwise, if we, if we rob journalism of context, if we rob the stories of their context, there's no point to them. It's just like there's a disease or a plague going on. What is going on is the most incredible concentration of wealth in the history of the Indian Republic since it gained freedom in 1947. If you look at the Credit Suisse, the credit, Oxfam came out recently with its inequality report. And one of the things, it's based on data from the multinational bank, Credit Suisse. The Credit Suisse data show us that there are countries that are more unequal than India, like South Africa. However, between 2000 and 2015, in no country did inequality grow faster than in India. Yet, there is not a single full-time rural reporter in the country called India with 833 million rural Indians. Not a, I was the last one. I was the rural editor of a newspaper called The Hindu. I left in 2014. Um, and
and there is absolutely no full-time national level rural correspondent in the country of 833 million rural citizens. Worldwide, rurality is collapsing and you can see the share of the rural areas in the media is down to almost nothing. Okay? In India, the Center for Media Studies data show us that in the top newspapers and channels in front page and at prime time, rural India, village India, occupied 0.18% of space. In uh, prime time TV, less than that. If you take agriculture as a whole, 0.24%. Okay? 833 million people live there, speaking 780 languages, six of which are spoken by, by more than 50 million, three of which are spoken by more than 80 million. Here's the most complex part of the planet, and it gets zero space in the media, except when people die in very large numbers, which they're doing right now. Here's the context. Uh, the top richest 1% of Indians now own 55% of all wealth. By the way, that compares with the United States where it is 34%. Okay? The richest single Indian who has also put up literally the costliest and ugliest residence in Mumbai, running to 60 floors to a height of 27 floors because he's got claustrophobia, he likes high roofs. Uh, the richest Indian owns more wealth than 250 million Indians at the bottom. The richest 15 Indians own more wealth than half the population. The richest 100 Indians own more wealth than the top two thirds. By the way, India ranks fourth in the world or third now in the world in the number of dollar billionaires. We've, we've disposed of Germany long ago. They used to compete with us 10 years ago. But you're way behind now, okay? Uh, we've got more billionaires than anyone except uh, the United States, China, and the Russians seem to have taken a bit of a dip recently. So oil prices being what they are. And anyway, I never took the Russians seriously. Every five years, they send all their billionaires to prison. We, we are a mature democracy. We send us to parliament. <laughs> okay, now in this period, in the same period of this astonishing growth of wealth, India's share of world hunger grew from 21% to 25%. Though the absolute number of hungry fell, it meant that other countries were doing much better in dealing with hunger. China's share came down dramatically. Ours went up from one-fifth of the world's hungry population to one-fourth in the same period of this massive accumulation of wealth. Now, what does an Indian farming family earn compared to these guys? We're talking about dollar billionaires, we're talking about the third richest list of dollar billionaires in the world. What does an Indian farm household, five member household earns income from all sources, farming and non-farming, the average income is $95 a month for a family of five. So at one end of the spectrum, you've got the world's third biggest list of dollar billionaires. At the other end of the spectrum, millions of families whose average income is $95 a month for a family of five from all sources for farming. Suicide rates amongst Indian farmers are a chilling 47% higher than for the rest of the population minus farmers. Of course, the government will interpret this for you differently and they've got lots of columnists who's, you know, whose ass has never left the seat in their newsrooms to interpret it, to show you that it isn't so. Yeah, you've got all, the, I'm saying look at the role of the media now. It is to, you know, it, it's, it's a reversal of the, to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. They've just turned that on its head, okay? Suicides are occurring on a shrinking farming base. So the rates are in fact growing higher. Let me give you the number. Between the 91 census and the 2011 census, India lost 15 million farmers. That's more than 2,000 a day. Where did they go? Most of them have fallen into the ranks of agricultural laborers. That is, your full-time farmers have fallen into the ranks of the agrarian underclass. They've become agricultural laborers. 2,000 a day. You do the math. 20 years, 15 million. 
7.2 million in the first 10 years, 91 to 2001, 7.7 million in the second 20 years, and it is still going on dramatically. Maharashtra, the state of, you know, you're all familiar with Mumbai. Mumbai belongs to a state called Maharashtra, a state of 115 million people, and where two thirds of our billionaires have an address. They, that's their home, at least on their passport address. Maharashtra has a suicide rate, as of 2011 census, of 29.1 per 100,000 farmers. Okay, it means that an a farmer in that state is three times more likely to kill himself than any other Indian citizen other than farmers. There's another state which has a figure of six times more likely to kill himself or herself than anyone else. Um, and all these numbers are coming despite, unfortunately, as Gavin said, I was the guy who broke that story. I'll tell you how it broke, it's, it's astonishing. And. Uh, when we broke that sto story, it's become a politically uncomfortable thing. Governments have started declaring zero farmer suicides. I mean, you can't have such a situation, I'd love it, but they're declaring zero suicides. 12 states and six union territories, we have 29 states and seven union territories, out of which 12 states and six union territories last year declared zero. The government of the center has reorganized the entire methodology of the crime base, of the crime, uh, of the crime database, in order to show lower numbers. And still, they commit suicide. Okay? Now you're looking at an unbelievable tragedy. The farm crisis is not, the suicides are not equal to the farm crisis. The agrarian crisis is much larger than the farm crisis. For every farmer who takes his or her life, there are a million who don't, but who are in equally a miserable situation. However, today in the time, I'm talking to you about the farm suicides. Um, the, so as of 2014 June, uh, January, the number, total number of suicides crossed 300,000. Uh, how, how do they fiddle the numbers? Look, there are media organizations with incredible resources not putting on a single person to look at what is being done in Delhi. They don't need to go to the damn rural areas. Okay, now all these states that have started cutting down the numbers of suicides, do you know how we can find out how they're fudging it? Like any other column of mathematics, there's a column at the end called others. So look at the fun. The second worst state in the country Karnataka sees a dip of 90% in farm suicides in the year 2014, but the others column increases by 245%. There are five states that, this is the latest data, there are five states that account for two thirds of all the farm suicides, and by the way, they're all high commercial crop green revolution areas, all of them, and uh, they have seen a decline of so, so many thousands of suicides last year. However, the others column has increased by 128%. So you know where the bodies are going. Because the total people, guy kills himself, he kills himself. That number's got to be somewhere. Apart from this, we don't record, very marginally record women's suicides as farmers. We record them as women's suicides. We don't accept them as farmers because they do, traditionally, they don't have property rights in land. Not by law, but by custom. Uh, you can ask me about that if, if you like. But the picture of inequality that I'm trying to give you, I think is best given to you by a picture. Okay, uh, can I have that operational? Okay, I'll, while someone gets to it, I, I, I continue. Uh, Okay. Yeah, it's here. It's on. Now, by the way, the, welcome to the new India, the globalized. These are in the heaviest drought areas in a state. Now they have put up in this particular complex two buildings, 35 floors, 34, 37 floors each, and one floor of the builder connecting these two. 
75 swimming pools, one private swimming pool on each and every floor, okay? If the building gets done, which of course we all hope it won't, this is what it will look like, and we're resisting it. 75 swimming pools up there, okay? This is India, and this is drought-prone areas. Uh, if it gets complete, this is what the artist's vision or nightmare, as you like, will be. By the way, this is not one-off. There are scores of such buildings coming up in the drought areas, okay? There are scores of them coming up. They're, we are trying to stop those. In my hometown of Chennai, we are a more cultured and refined people. It's too ugly and gross to have one every floor, so we have one every three floors. <laughs> more refined and elegant, isn't it? My favorite is on the road from Mumbai to Pune. I'm a rural reporter. I'm on the road most two-thirds of the year. On the floor, on the road from Mumbai to Pune is this uh, lovely sign, villas, luxury homes with attached forest reserve. Okay. You know, in that state of Maharashtra, the damn tiger doesn't have an attached forest reserve, but, but the builders do. And if you think it's just us, okay, if you think, by the way, two kilometers from the board, this is how poor Indians actually collect their water, right? And if you think it's just us, London, here we come. This is a building coming up not far from where Gavin will be. So you can always get there, Gavin. It's across an avenue, a pure glass pool. So you can swim and tell the guys, in the, look at all those little people down there in the traffic. And look, you cannot deal with the issues of poverty and deprivation in the world today if you do not understand and engage with the issues of wealth and concentration and inequality. If you don't do that, you're not doing yourself or your readers or your viewers any favors, okay? So that, that is, that's some of the little stuff I wanted to show you. There are lots of other slides, but we don't have time for that. In the farm suicides, four or five stages go through with governments. The first is nonsense, nothing of the sorts happening. Then stout denial. Then, yeah, there is a problem, but you know all these guys, you know, there are, there's some depression problem. They try medicalizing the suicides. Every suicide has an element of depression in it. And if you were bankrupt and your field was taken over, you'd be depressed too. Yeah, then comes the explanation from experts in the newspaper that look at the documents given, rise in uh, alcoholism. These guys are killing themselves, they're all drunkards. They drink too much, they kill. The problem with that argument, as I keep telling the editors, is you know, if alcoholism was the major driver of suicides, damn it, there'd be no journalists left in the world. <laughs> and, and very few academics. <laughs> and no human rights activists at all. <laughs> right, so let's skip that one. Every suicide has a multiplicity of factors. But this has come with a package of policies that has unfolded in country after country, nation after nation across the world. Withdrawal of the state from sectors that matter to poor people. Imposition of user costs on those who can afford it least. The transfer of resources from poor to rich. 53% of Maharashtra's agricultural credit is disbursed in the metropolis of Mumbai. What sort of farming do you have in Mumbai? Okay. Agricultural credit, not rural credit, is disbursed. 53% of the state of Maharashtra is disbursed in Mumbai. These are things for journalists to do, to be telling their readers. And by the way, there are lots of journalists who try doing it, but can't, it won't fly in their newspapers. It won't fly in their channels, okay? Because they want to get published. There are hundreds of young journalists who have tried telling the story of the farm suicides. I was privileged. I came into journalism at another period and was able to get away with a lot because I was senior to many of the editors, you know, who don't want to carry such stuff. Uh, a number, of, and then the fourth factor, uh, worldwide, the privatization of just about everything, okay? You've had, fifth, the rise of market fundamentalism. Sixth, the stunning inequality that accompanies it. All these went into sets of agricultural policies that directly favor agribusiness over agriculturists, right? So. So remember, the same principles, a lot of people don't realize this, farm suicide rates are very high 
in the American Midwest. They are very high in France as of now, which has been seeing a large spell of farm suicides. They're nothing compared to India, but then, oh yeah, if you look at the cotton growing nations of Chad, Benin, Mali, Burkina Faso, two of the presidents of those countries wrote an article for the New York Times, which the Times condescendingly, I think, published as a letter. Your subsidies are strangling our people. A whole bunch of policies in the name of market, in the na essentially neoliberal programs, have devastated small farmers all across the world. You're looking at, in your time, and this is a context, the collapse of rurality and the final assault on smallholder farmers. And please don't allow anyone to tell you lies about this. Even today, 70% of the world's food comes from small and family farms. We don't see it, it's not so visible, because most of those are subsistence farmers. The farm food is consumed on the farm. It doesn't come out in branded names on the supermarket shelves, so you don't realize it. But 70% of the world's food still comes from small and family farms. And Part of journalism's task, I believe, is to cover what's happening to smallholder farming and the giant behemoth. Look, we've all covered the Arab Spring, and many have romanticized the role of Google and Twitter in it. Please look at the role of food companies, agribusiness companies, and food, food control processing companies before that uprising, where you saw 85% percent increase, percent increases in the price of the basic bread that Egypt consumed. Ask yourself, the people didn't come out of there because of Google and Twitter. If they did, why aren't they doing it now? Okay. You had very real, solid social and economic compulsions behind people coming out and protesting in such large numbers. In India, the imposition of neoliberal economic policies sought to huge cost increases for the peasant farmer. The input cost for cultivation of 1% of co for one acre of cotton has risen by between 300 to 500%. By 300 to 500%. Yeah. So we've had um, um, massive indebtedness as a result at the same time that the government is withdrawing credit from the farmer and diverting it to agribusiness corporations. This has happened in country after country after country in the world. It's not just in third world countries. Please understand you're watching a life and death struggle of small farmers, small holders all over the world against corporate agribusiness. This needs to be investigated. It needs, we need to investigate the human condition. The privatization of water that is happening in country after country is also affecting the small farmer massively. Diversion of water to industry, diversion of water to, the, to our swimming pools. Let me tell you one word about who are the laborers who build the swimming pool. If you're the kind of journalist I am, you don't go and interview the builder, which I believe The Guardian did for this story, but uh, you go and talk to the guys who are building that, putting up that building, and you ask them, and I'm sure they spoke to others also, but here's what I found. When I spoke to the um, workers, construction workers in these sites with those luxury villas with forest reserve attached, okay, who are you guys? They're all small marginal farmers and agricultural laborers who have fled their villages because there is no water. Their farming has collapsed because there is no water, so they come to the cities to build our swimming pools, okay? Look, there is a moral dimension to what we call investigative journalism. And if there is no moral dimension to journalism, then I don't want journalism. It's, that's, it's, it's extremely... You know, the, you know how you can even look at it as I've been persuading the Indian ruling elite to look at it don't have large commissions of inquiry. They've had about 30. Um, and I've been the subject of one of those inquiries. Not so much the farmer as how much damage I did to the state of Maharashtra. In fact, I had the privilege of appearing on the front page of Mumbai Times, of the, the, the supplement called Mumbai Mirror, as enemy of the state. But it was a very limited to one state, so it's okay, I guess. So. Uh, um, defames the state. Sign out the, that was the front page. Nice way to begin your morning. Now, if 
if you're going to, you know, seriously in nation after nation, this process is on. How do they try fudging the numbers? One, as I said, they've started increasing the others column and breaking up the farmers. How did it begin? It began when we stumbled on a virtual graveyard of farmers because we found in the district of Anantapur in Rayal Sima in Andhra Pradesh, a large number of farmers' suicides were occurring which were coming in the others column. And when we broke it up, we found that hundreds of them, the death was recorded as suicide due to unbearable stomachache. Well, there's a very good reason for that because the mode of suicide was to swallow pesticide. I assure you, you will have a stomachache and a pretty bad one before you die. But they turned the sequence on its head. You, had, you committed suicide and you experienced a terrible stomach pain. They turned it on its head in the police recording. Suicide due to unbearable stomachache. The victim deceased, unable to bear the stomachache. The stomach ache came because he tried committing suicide. Okay. Then when we broke that up, that's when the story broke nationally in 2001. I've stayed with that wretched story for 16 years. I say wretched because it's terrible. I have been to 900 households where people have committed suicide. It's not fun. It is not fun. And the letters the people are leaving behind. The letter, in, nowhere else have I seen this. Nowhere else in the world have I know of this, do I know of this, in Vidarbha, in Maharashtra and elsewhere, people are addressing their suicide notes, not to their wives, not to their loved ones, not to their friends and neighbors. They're addressing, they're addressing their suicide, they're addressing their suicide notes to the finance minister of India, to the president of India, saying, I'm going. Please see that the banks do not harass my family. The same banks have allowed one of those billionaires to leave the country last week, owing billions of billions and billions of rupees to Indian banks which are teetering because of people like him and a hundred other super rich people who borrowed money from public sector banks never to return. But those letters, they, would, they will break your heart to read those letters. In fact, one of India's good writers, in Kerala has declared in the 21st century, the, lit, the literature of the 21st century is the suicide note, not fiction, not non-fiction. The, the suicide note is the literature of the 21st century. In this, I have, come I have come across dozens of these notes. I've come across notes where guys have said, and by the way, you're not able to access these notes. They're part of police record, they're locked up there. Okay, and there are guys telling the finance minister, it's like a page or two pages out of Charles Dickens, the kind of, the kind of experiences with money lenders, the kind of experiences with the banks, you know, it's like a page out of Dickens and, and worse. If you just, they are telling you the reasons, they are telling you that you have made Farming for small farmers, unviable, unbearable. We can't take this anymore. Imagine that they're addressing their notes to the prime minister of the country, not to their wives, not to their children, but to the finance minister in the hope that some, they recognize what we are refusing to recognize, that these calamities are driven by human agency, by conscious policy. There may be many factors, but many of those factors are grounded in these kind of in these kind of changes. As I said, even in Western Africa, the subsidies from the West to corporate agribusiness is one of those factors. The presidents of Mali and Burkina Faso wrote a letter to the New York Times. Your subsidies are strangling our people. Okay? My, the, leading, the leading intellectual in Western India on the farm crisis, his name is Vijay Javandia, he's an old friend of mine, keeps reading up all the new subsidy news from different parts of the world. One day I was there when, you know, there was this young reporter who asked him, Mr. Javandia, what is your, you know, he was looking at all the figures of $3 a day per cow, those kind of subsidies. This was 2005, 6 And when asked, 
Mr. Javandia, what is the dream of the Indian farmer? He said without hesitation, the dream of the Indian farmer is to be born a European cow. <laughs> okay. And you have, but going back to the notes, going back to people, going back, doing shoe leather journalism where you listen to people and what they're telling you. Okay. There are three, I'm going to conclude with the thing that there are three, four um, things within journalism that have been happening, shaping it very dramatically. Okay? One, as I said, we are down to either journalism or stenography. We all know about the corporatization of the media, but the extent to which that corporatization is socializing entire generations is something I think we really have not looked at seriously enough. The second is, whether in America, and I suspect in Europe, PR jobs are outpacing journalism jobs. Public relations jobs are outpacing journalism jobs at the rate of three to one. You'll find Robert McChesney giving you those figures in his book. When the Gulf oil spill took place, David Barstow of the New York Times wrote in the Columbia Journalism Review that there were far more in the hearings that followed than Coast Guard's hearings, there were far more public relations operatives in the hall than there were reporters. Because they were there, the reporters were there supposedly to ask questions. The PR guys were to figure out nice smart answers to give. Okay? So PR is, take, and that's apart from all the other journal, from all those journalists who function as PR agents anyway. Yeah. So we, you're having a serious, serious crisis of journalism a moral crisis of journalism, if you like, plus the social and economic one. We are in the period of the greatest inequality this planet has seen since the Great Depression. We are in an inequality which Oxfam has summed up for you from Credit Suisse data, that 63 individuals own more wealth than half the world's population. Okay? You are in an incredible situation of that. If we choose to treat journalism as a craft, as a business, as a revenue model, I think we're doomed, okay? There is something that goes beyond journalism. Newspapers are a business, right? Television is a business. Journalism, journalism is a calling. You do it because it has to be done. It summons you to do something. Throughout, by the way, I end with what I began. I said that all the great things in journalism came from outside the so-called mainstream or corporate media, historically that was true as well. All those great journalists were amateurs. Thomas Paine, okay, or a Gandhi, or an Ambedkar, who earned their living as journalists, who produced 100 volumes of collected works each, more than any living journalist can claim. Journalism, art, literature did not come from the investments of any corporation. They came out of communities and societies. We need to take them back to communities and societies. I think we need to investigate, to do investigative journalism and we need to investigate journalism. Thank you very much. Take some questions now. Okay. <laughs> we have time for questions, and uh, we'll happily take them now. Ooh. Let me, let me make a quick a set of, a, a couple of announcements before we go on. I've been asked to mention that. Uh, there is a roller outside which is being projected on the walls of a very high standard and of extremely interesting material of uh, the prices that have been paid by hackers and journalists to do the work they do and all the, the, uh, the ghastly results of it. And that's on, on the wall going outside. It's done by Nadine Anelkin uh, and it's uh, really worth having a look at. We have an anonymous artist uh, in the coffee area and that's worth looking at absolutely as well. Uh, and in the phone, there'll be a phone installation of the Pang Collective. Um, 
And I'll leave that to, for you to find out because it's actually quite interesting and unique uh, and it's well worth seeing. But having mentioned that now, um, I think if anybody has questions, let's, let's have them for peace on it. Okay, there was one, one coming there. A very yeah. simple question. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hello and... Um, yes. Very simple question about... I'm a documentary filmmaker and um, uh, you spoke about investigating journalism. Sorry, spoke about? You, the last thing you said was about investigating journalism also. Yeah. Can you uh, expand more about this? Because okay. It's, very, it's difficult also. So. Okay. But, um, right, I'll, I'll do that. Can I take two more questions yeah, and answer sure. three? Are there more questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I think there are... Two. Um, um, I was wondering um, why there are not more journalists um, doing the work you do in India, or maybe you could talk a bit about um, if there are others, um, what problems are they facing or are you facing, um, maybe not only from the system, from the political, but also from uh, colleagues, from, I don't know, your editors or people within uh, media business. Okay, there's a lady here who's wanting to... Uh, and one more question about the newspapers. Uh, oh. Real newspapers are losing readers. Are there any new structures uh, in India, uh, electronically, for example, who started to report from the uh, rural areas? You have a question? Okay, um, I'll, after this I'll reply, yeah. Have you personally been prosecuted and in which way? Uh, do you want to say something about Anas? There's one over here too. Yeah. About investigating journalism itself. Look, I think the biggest threat to journalism comes from corporate ownership of media. That control is what shrinks. You have, you know, it's the paradox of Indian journalism, for instance. 80 years ago, you know, uh, we had a tiny press and it could put the mightiest empire on the world on the defensive. A tiny press, low literacy rates, low circulation, but that journalism had moral authority. It could, make, it could make life miserable for the British Empire to the extent that they passed law after law to stifle Indian journalism. Okay? The Vernacular Press Act, the Sedition Act, under which the present Indian government is arresting those campus kids. It's arresting them on charges of sedition. Okay? So, such a tiny press could make such a large empire defensive. Today, a gigantic media serves a narrowest so social function. Then, a tiny media served a huge social function. Now, a gigantic, gargantuan media served the narrowest of social functions, which is profit for their corporate bosses. Okay? So, that is the paradox of Indian journalism. And when I say investigating, let me put it this way. Today, in the neoliberal packages and policies that many of us have simply accepted as a given, there is no alternative, it's going to happen. The fact is that media corporate owners are amongst the biggest beneficiaries of the policies of privatization in India. If we privatize Spectrum, for instance, if we privatize Spectrum, Tata's, Ambani's, Birla's, um, all these guys are major players in the media one way or the other. The Ambani's and Birla's are major owners of media. <clears throat> They're going, you know Ambani is that guy who has more wealth than 250 million Indians, right? Man, Berlusconi is nobody, <laughs> right? Now this guy has more wealth than 250 million Indians and owns the largest news network. 
the network 18. He owns more channels than he can name, honestly. He doesn't know them, but because he owns whole groups. Now, when the beneficiaries of the rotten, of the policy structures that are devastating farmers and agricultural laborers, when the beneficiaries are, include major media owners, how the heck are you going to get serious coverage of it? You're going to get stuff like me being enemy of the state. Okay? That's what you're going to get. So, and, you, and you're going to get guys from, you know, somebody with a degree from Harvard Business School telling me that you don't really understand economics. You see, the farmers are dying because. He won't recognize a farmer if the farmer kicked him in the slats. Okay? But, but that's where he is. I mean, that's, what, that's where the publicity goes. That's where the coverage goes. Also, when investigating journalism, we did that in 2009 inside the corporate media, within the mainstream media. We exposed the largest ever, ever existence of selling editorial space, particularly during election times, for off-record payments. You can look up the scandal. You can do a search. It's called paid news. I coined that word for it in, 2000, in the 2000s. It appears as news on the front page. It's entirely the product of one political party or individual paying for that in millions to the newspaper as part of his election campaign. Do you know what happened? When we, when we did it, it was recognized. They all threatened, threatened me with legal notices. Not one came. I was desperate to get one. <laughs> I wanted to bring those media bosses into the court to cross-question them. They sent notices after, no I mean, they threatened notices like anything from every media channel, but they never did it. Now, um, the Press Council of India took note of the scandal, ordered an inquiry. The inquiry did a fantastic job. Inquiry was headed by a colleague called Paranjoy Guha Takurta. Paranjoy Guha Takurta, who I'm happy to say has since become the editor of the Economic and Political Weekly, India's most respected academic journal, but not in the mainstream media. Hmm? Paranjoy Guha Takurta and Srinivas Reddy produced a devastating report going beyond the stuff I'd written, confirming everything I'd written and a couple of others had written. Do you know what the press council did? It suppressed its own report. It suppressed its own report saying a 72-page report became 12 pages and all the names. Because my point was that the only way you're going to get through this is to name and shame. Okay? They, all the media owners sit on the press council. They have representatives. They got the names removed. Later, the chairman of the press council changed. A Supreme Court judge came in who put up the report online. He, he brought it out and nobody covered it few paragraphs here and there saying it's out there because you'll be then taking on really big names. So you need to keep investigating journalism regularly, stringently. Second, um, you know, many of those you said in journalism facing political and other pressures. Look, I, I have a, um, a sense of this that India is somewhat different. As one of my friends put it the other day at a meeting of the Mumbai Collective, in India, we have freedom of speech. We don't have freedom after making the speech. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we get to say anything we like and the nature of the legal process, <clears throat> the nature of the legal process is that your grandkids and mine will be fighting that case. Right, so it'll, it'll just go on forever. However, they are now using, they are now using the Sedition Act, okay? A 150-year-old British act to suppress freedom fighters, I mean, over a century old, to suppress freedom fighters, to brutalize them. The, the grounds on which you can be thrown in jail are incredible, and you're using it against a bunch of college kids. Doctoring videos and replacing what they said with superimposed audio, and that kid, the president of the Jawaharlal Nehru University Students' Union, you know, in his 20s, you use this kind of stuff. The threat to people like me is far less. I would love to romanticize myself to you and 
tell you how I'm living by the minute and fearing assassination tomorrow. You, <laughs> I've actually, I, I'm a rural reporter. I feel far safer in rural India than in urban India. In rural India, people invite you without ever having known you before, let you share their meal, stay in their home. Okay, so by and large, it's not that dangerous as one might. Also, let me put this this way. How da what dangers you invite depends on what journalism you do. If you're doing page three journalism, if you're doing society and gossip journalism, there's no greater risk to you than that the leading film star will not talk to you for a week. Okay, and that's the bulk of what's going on. Right, now if you actually start questioning and needling, and you start doing journalism that threatens entrenched interest, you do journalism that threatens the powerful. That's when the risks come up. Now, again, India is in some respects a 10% democracy. If you belong to the 10% privileged classes as I do, you can get away with most everything. You know, I think we are much freer and we can say much more outrageous things, certainly than our colleagues in the US press can. Okay, because getting anything pinned down in the courts is quite an issue in India. So those of us who belong to that 10%, we get away with a lot. So I don't want to exaggerate how much danger. I was, when I was an urban-based journalist in Mumbai, I had lots more trouble with fundamentalist organizations coming and smashing up the office of the tabloid I was in. But that brings me to a point that's important for all of you. Today, India, and I believe in other parts of the world, the ruling alliance is an alliance of socio-religious fundamentalists and market economic fundamentalists. These two guys need each other. Remember that in the most troubled part of the planet, the United States depends on two completely fundamentalist regimes called Israel and Saudi Arabia. Right? That's who it depends on. In India, we have absolutely a situation of socio-religious fundamentalists. A prime minister who tells, who, who announces in a public meeting that India knew genetic engineering 20,000 years ago, that we had flying aircraft, you know? I mean, at least if he'd let us have a ride on one of them, but, but you know, uh, we knew stem cell engineering from the time of the Mahabharat. I'm not joking, please look it up. He's made these in speeches. He has said these things in speeches, but the media owners are not going to crack down on that. They are now in a dilemma because he's not able to deliver on the market side of their demands. But it's an alliance. So you, you, you are going to have many problems. The problems that journalists of my class background are going to face is to be marginalized or sidelined within the mainstream media. That's a problem. Um, about the rural areas and personally being, oh yeah, I mean, who in this audience has not had their tranche of crap mail? I mean, and threats and, you know, I don't, I mean, it, let's not even waste time on that. You do have seriously dangerous forces at, around power today. Three rationalists have been murdered in the last two years assassinated in exactly the same fashion. Nobody's in jail, nobody's in prison. Gobind Pansare, leading rationalist and trade union leader of Maharashtra, secretary of the Communist Party in that state. Narendra Dabolkar, father of Maharashtra's anti-superstition movement and rationalist, rationalist uh, movement. M.M. Kalburgi in Karnataka, a known rationalist. Much more than people who are secular, the fundamentalists fear rationalists because they come and they show that the bullshit is actually bullshit, right? So you, they, in that game, you, you will encounter dangers. It's a choice up to you whether you take, um, whether you take the risk or not. Lastly, about rural areas. Are there newspapers? Oh yes, I repeat, there are hundreds of journalists doing fantastic work in India, as I'm sure there are hundreds of journalists in other countries doing fantastic work. The point is they've been robbed of their platform. There was the Hindu, 
was the only newspaper where I worked for 10 years. We created the only rural platform in the world that operated on the front page, the op-ed page, and the edit page, rather than being put into a ghetto called agriculture. That has gone. The platform has gone. It doesn't exist in any other newspaper now. So you have the paradox of bright, young, fantastic journalists. That's why we are trying to create new platforms in digital which will allow for those spaces. It's called the People's Archive of Rural India. Have a look. Thank you. Actually, we've got um, a couple of announcements. One uh, curious in that our next speaker has not arrived. And uh, he was coming from a long way, but he simply hasn't arrived at all. Unless he's somewhere in the audience. He occasionally uh, uh, appears in a rather curious fashion. Uh, Anas, are you here? No, I didn't think so, but, he, but just in case. He makes dramatic entrances. He still may do this in the next day or so. But there, we have two um, announcements we'd like to make. One um, with Sander about our crypto bar. And uh, why don't you come up and tell us a bit about that. And then we've also got another announcement to come to follow about the new speaks, youth media uh, filming proposition. Sander, go ahead. Hello. My name is uh, Sander Feynema, and I'm uh, running the crypto bar here at uh, Logan Symposium. And uh, I figure most of you are journalists, so um, if you're working with uh, confidential sources, or you need to keep your communications confidential, who you're talking to, etc., the contents of those uh, things, your files, etc., we offer practical advice uh, and training to how to use tools like email encryption, OTR, chat encryption, um, Linux-based operating systems like Tails that are completely, um, you boot it on a USB stick and um, completely self-contained, all runs through the Tor network, so your location isn't um, easy, easy to, uh, re to be revealed by intelligence agencies and others. So, um, so that's basically what we do. It's downstairs uh, with me and the other volunteers at the crypto bar. So we train people to how to practically use tools to uh, encrypt their communications and defeat surveillance. So um, that was my very short uh, introduction and shout out for the crypto bar. So let me now hand it over to the new speak. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Charlotte and I'm one of the directors of Newspeaks. Newspeaks is a youth media organization. We train young people and we publish media, journalistic video content, um, which is relevant to, to young people. And the reason for that is we felt, in the UK at least, there's very, very little media, journalistic media particularly, that represents young people. And where it does exist, it's dumbed down to the point that it's almost irrelevant. And not only that, but the media that, which is published about young people is often very, very negative, and we wanted to do something to combat this. So we set up our own organization and started producing stories. And we've been running for a little while. Uh, we produced a few stories. We, we work on the basis that we have a core team and we have a whole satellite of, um, of young people that work with us, contributing stories all the time, coming to us with new ideas. We have a whole group of uh, 13 young journalists here at the symposium this weekend. And they will be interviewing speakers. They may be um, speaking to you. We have silent disco headsets that anybody can listen to the interviews that we're conducting, either inside the building or outside the building. Uh, we'll be in the streets, talking to people in the street, asking if they want to listen to some of the interviews that we're conducting upstairs. And we've also got some of our episodes from the programs that we produce on the TV screens in our corner upstairs. So whilst our content is published for young people to re represent young people in journalism and bring important issues to that group of people who really need to know these things, they need to know about the speakers and the, and the things that are being spoken about. We also feel that our content is relevant to people who are over the age of 26. And whilst I look around the room and don't see anyone over the age of, looks over the age of 21, if there is anyone and you want to come and engage with us, then we're here and we, we really want to communicate with you. So we really hope that you come and see what we're doing and, uh, and share in the Newspeaks adventure here. Thank you.